Good morning, happy Easter. He is risen. <laughs> Come on, let's rise up and sing some great songs together.
Amen. You may be seated. Happy Easter. He is risen. I love it. You know, um, we, I, I've pastored a long time, and when I pastored in Texas, they don't do that in Texas. I don't know why. That's a, su- a southern thing or something. I don't know, but I always, I got to remember, man, I'm in the south. When I go on Easter morning, I got to say, he is risen, so you can say, he is risen indeed back, and what an amazing thing that is to be able to say as we celebrate our risen Savior this morning, and we are so, so grateful to see you today. Thank you for being here with us today. We want to welcome our church family who is here with us today. We want to welcome those of you who are watching online or will be watching online and joining us, and we appreciate you worshiping with us wherever you may be. I know a lot of folks are gone, traveling, seeing family, things like that, so we thank the Lord for modern technology that allows us to, to be together even when we can't be in the same room together. Uh, and then certainly we want to we want to welcome our guests today. If you're a guest with us today, thank you so much for being here on this Easter morning. We're honored by your presence. And uh, if you'd like to find out some more information about our church, maybe you don't have a regular church home, uh, we would love for you uh, to to give us a call uh, or allow us to reach back out to you to answer questions. So there's a couple of ways you can go about doing that. There's a connection card in the seat pocket in front of you. You can take that out, uh, fill that out, drop that in the offering boxes uh, as you leave today. Those are right there by the back doors. And uh, we will uh, email you, give you a call back, whatever information you you put on there that you would like us to reach you at. uh, We'd be happy to answer any questions you have, pray with you, whatever it might be. Uh, Or you can scan with your phone the QR code that's on that card. Uh, that will pull up a form right there that you can send to us via email. And again, we'd love to get back with you and uh, help you in any way that we can. You're watching online, you can scan the QR code that you see there on the screen at this time or text the word hello to the number that you see. And we would love to get back with you as well. But it is a beautiful day today. It is Easter morning. It is a day of celebration. It is the very bedrock and foundation of our hope. And uh, we are excited to worship with you today. So let's pray together. And then we're going to continue to worship the Lord through song. And lift our voices to the Lord and uh, ready our hearts for his word this morning. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for uh, what this day signifies for all of us as believers around the globe. And what it signifies for those who do not yet know you as Savior. What this means for them, Lord. There is the hope of salvation because you, Lord Jesus, have overcome sin and the grave. Death has been defeated. You walked out of that tomb And we sing and we celebrate because our lives are bound up in this truth and in this reality. And because of the hope of the resurrection, we too shall be resurrected. And so we thank you for that today. We thank you for life. We thank you for new beginnings. We thank you for what all of this represents for us today in Christ Jesus. And so we pray today, Lord, giving you thanks for our church family, giving you thanks for our guests who are present with us today. Lord, may they feel welcome. Lord, may you be with us as we worship you through song, lifting our voices, lifting our souls to you, and would you ready our hearts for your word this morning, and we pray this in the mighty name of our risen Savior, Jesus, amen.
name that joy is in this place today oh what a glorious celebration and today may the day be the day of salvation for some that are in this building some that are listening by technology lord today is the day of salvation we proclaim it not only on their lives but over our lives too god family members we ask you supernaturally to just go and prick the hearts of those you have already ordained to receive you today we agree with you in jesus name lord joy in the house of the Lord today. Amen and amen.
Thank you, Rebecca. Well, 2,000 years ago, on this, a Sunday morning, hell thought it had a victory. It seemed as if the long-awaited Messiah, who would to be born through Israel to be a blessing to all mankind, it seemed as if he was dead. It seemed as if they had finished him. It seemed as if hell had won. The Jewish leaders thought they had a victory. The Jewish leaders 2,000 years ago who had ushered this in, seeking the approval of Rome and getting Rome on board to put this Jesus to death, thought that they had finally finished Jesus and his followers in this whole message, in this whole ministry, in this whole movement, if the leader was removed, now would be done away with. But the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ changed everything. It changed the scope of history, the scope of humanity. It changed the scope of eternity. And just a very short period of time, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ revealed that the Pharisees did not have the victory, that Rome did not have the victory, and that hell itself did not have the victory. And ever since then, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ has been changing everything. It's been changing lives. And this morning, I don't know what your life was like, all of you. We, we come into a place like this on a Sunday morning. We go to church. We get dressed up. It's Easter Sunday. You've got plans with the family. You've got a big dinner you're going to have later. You're going to do all of those things that come along. But, but for many people coming into a place like this, to a place of worship like this, there are still a magnitude of things that are weighing upon your soul. There is despair and discouragement. There's grief and guilt and sorrow. There's fear and doubt. I mean, it seems like everywhere we turn right now, all of those things are present in our world, are they not? I mean, just get on social media for a second, and the next thing you know, uh, the world is falling apart. And everybody is living with fear and doubt and dread and guilt and sorrow and all of these things, doubt and despair and discouragement. And we throw it out there in this world. And we go, where's the answer? And all along the Bible is saying the answer is found in the one event that has changed and continues and will always change everything for humanity. And that is the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, it's important to note that we're talking about a bodily, physical resurrection. We're not talking about some metaphysical event that somehow inspired people through the ages. If Christ did not walk out of the tomb in a physical, bodily way, then Paul says our hope is for nothing. But because Christ literally rose from the dead, overcame death and the grave and sin itself, we have the hope of the resurrection. We have the hope that changes everything for our lives and the lives of our fellow man for eternity. This resurrection, defeating death and completing the atonement for our sins, brings us the hope that is needed for all of humanity. And this morning, I, I want to share how the resurrection changed the lives of several people mentioned in the Gospels, of what they were dealing with, and how it changed their lives, and how that might affect us today, because I really do believe that Easter changes everything, and I also know that many of us walk into this place with those burdens that I just mentioned, because life is tough sometimes. The Bible says that all of creation groans into the day of redemption, that it is awaiting the return of the one who has risen, the Lord Jesus. And so until that day, we're dealing with what it means to live and war and and. and and walk in a fallen, sinful world, and all of the ramifications of that, all the difficulties that come with that. But we are not to be burdened by those things. That is not what is to define our lives. And so today, if you're dealing with some doubt and despair and discouragement and guilt and sorrow and fear, those things ought not define your lives because what we are celebrating today puts all of that ultimately to death, and you don't have to walk in that. 
And today I want to prove that to you by the lives of those who were closest to Jesus. Can you imagine what it was like for them? They had been following Jesus for three and a half years. They had, they had followed him all around. They had seen all of, all of his miracles. And, and by the way, the Bible tells us that, that all of the miracles that Jesus performed are not even accounted for. John says it would take up volumes upon volumes upon volumes if we were to record all of the things that Jesus said and did. So we have a glimpse of the miracles of Jesus. We have a glimpse of the, the sayings of Jesus, the messages of Jesus. We have what the Holy Spirit of God desires that we would know within the Gospels, but there is beyond that so much more that the disciples were all a part of. And yet on that day, he was dead. And with him, with his death, their hope had died. Their purpose had died. Their plans had died. Their joy had died. And all of a sudden, their lives were racked with despair and discouragement. Their lives were racked with guilt and sorrow and grief. Their lives were racked with doubt and fear. That was what was defining them in that moment, but it did not have to stay that way. And friends, it would not stay that way because of what we are about to read. And I want to point out, first of all, this one, Mary Magdalene. John chapter 20, verses 11 through 16, give us the recording of Mary at the tomb of the Lord Jesus. And this is what the Bible tells us. John chapter 20, verse 11, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And in that moment, she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. So this is a, a really amazing scene. There's a, there's a moment where Mary is at the tomb. She goes to the tomb, and the, st the stone has been rolled away, and she looks inside, and there is no body, but, but she thinks that Jesus has been carried away. Jesus appears to her, and for reasons that we're not fully privy to, in the sovereignty of God, there is a moment in which she does not recognize him. Now, this might be some kind of supernatural thing, or it might be that Jesus is kind of standing in some bushes over there by the, and she can't tell. Maybe she thinks he's a gardener, and she's just going to talk to this, whoever this is. And then as he steps out and says her name, again, we don't know exactly how this happens, but as he says her name, she sees him for who he is, the risen Savior, and she cries out, Rabboni, which means teacher. And there's this amazing moment in history right here that we get to see, recorded in the pages of the Gospels. And if you know ever, anything about Mary's life, who this woman was, Mary was a person who was hopelessly bound by evil when Jesus found her. The Bible tells us what is written of her in the Scriptures, in the New Testament, is that he cast out seven demons out of her life. She's called Mary Magdalene by all four gospel writers because Mary was her name and Magdala was where she was from. So she was Mary Magdalene or Mary of Magdala. According to the Jewish Talmud, this was a city with widespread reputation of sinful life, immorality. She comes to Jesus with seven demons. Jesus casts out these demons. Jesus brings a healing about spiritually in her life, and she becomes a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Luke mentions Mary immediately following his account of the sinful woman who washed Jesus' feet with her hair at the home of Simon, the Pharisee. And it's likely that Mary and this woman are the same person written about in Scripture. Mary's life was lifted up by Jesus out of evil, out of despair, out of discouragement, even before the resurrection, before this moth. And as I said, she became one of his most devoted disciples. She witnessed the events that the gospel writers have written about. She followed Jesus along with the 12 and others who followed Jesus from 
town to town, village to village, ministry to ministry. She heard Pontius Pilate pronounce the death sentence. She saw Jesus being beaten and humiliated by the soldiers and then the crowd. She was one who stood at the feet of the cross and watched Jesus breathe his last. And I would have to imagine in that moment all of the despair and all of the discouragement that Jesus had lifted her out of once again overwhelmed her life because now he was dead. The one who had given her hope, the one who had given her purpose, the one who had, had, had brought value into her life in a way that, that she had never known before, dignity into her life in a way that she had never known before, had eradicated the evil and the discouragement and the despair, is now lying in a grave. And so as she goes to the grave, she sees the body missing and believing that the body has been carried away. She is found once again in this place of despair and discouragement until she turns around and sees and hears the voice of her risen Savior, Jesus, who says to her, one word, Mary. In all of the despair and all of the discouragement and all of the fear and everything that was now consuming her soul in those hours since his death is now completely gone and she cries out, Rabboni, which means teacher. What an amazing picture that is. Now that word Rabboni it's a pretty amazing word. It's only used twice in the New Testament, here and in Mark chapter 10, verse 51, when it's spoken of Jesus by blind Bartimaeus. It has its root word, rab, which means teacher. We're familiar with the word rabbi. That word rabbi means the teacher. See, she's not just saying when she calls him rabbi that he is one teacher among many of good teachers. She's saying, You are the teacher. She's equating him with the Messiah. She's equating him with the hope and the promise of all of the Old Testament saints, all of the Jewish people who had believed upon a teacher, a rabbi, a Messiah, the one and only, unmatched by any other. And that's an important word for us to recognize because in her saying, Rabbi, she's not just recognizing him as a teacher of morality and good virtues. He is the giver of life. He is the giver of hope. He is the the, the chain breaker. He is the defeater of death. He is the one who has overcome. And she recognizes him in that moment. And in this moment, there is a celebration and there is a joy and there is a hope restored. Rabboni. And we live in a world today, and I suppose we always have, where for many people, Jesus is, is one teacher among many. He's one good guy among a string of good guys who have lived, who have taught us how to do good things and be good to one another. And if that's the extent of our understanding of Jesus, we've missed the plot. Because Jesus is not merely a good teacher. He's not merely one teacher among many. He is Rabboni. He is the teacher. He is the Messiah. He is the Savior. He is the hope of the world. He is the door. He is the bread of life. He and he alone is the only name under heaven through which man can be saved. There is no other. And Mary that day gives testimony to this reality of this risen Savior. He is Rabboni. He is the teacher. Mary's words put Jesus above every other such that he is the only one. I mean, what an amazing picture that would have been to see and just just in your mind's eye, just imagine Mary going to the tomb and the sorrow and the sadness and the grief and the tears that are being shed and the heartache that she is feeling as Jesus has died, only to be changed, completely changed in a matter of seconds as she turns and hears the voice of her Savior say her name, Mary, and all of that goes instantly away. Can you imagine if you were standing there, if you could see this, the, the joy that would have overtaken her face, the way that, that her body language would have changed, the, the smile that would have been brought about, the tears of joy that would have been cried and shed. This was a moment that changed Mary's life. Once again, this is a moment where the resurrection lifts up 
one out of discouragement and despair in ways that nothing else could. Now, listen, you and I may have not had this same experience, but I promise you this, this is the hope of the gospel. This is the hope of the resurrection, that if you are living with despair and discouragement, you, you feel as if the walls are closing in on your life, this is the good news today. That that's not really where you are. That's not really what defines your life. You don't have to walk in discouragement and despair because Christ has overcome all things. There is no discouragement that Christ has not overcome through the resurrection. There is no despair that Christ has not overcome through the resurrection. There is no sorrow that Christ has not overcome through the resurrection. All things have been lifted up through the power of the resurrection and done away with so that they do not define or characterize our life, our eternity, our purpose, our hopes. We are bound up in the hope of the resurrection, and all of that is dashed away. So what discouragement are you dealing with today? What despair have you come here this morning with incredible sense of discouragement in your life and where you are and the choices you've made and where that's led you and what's going on. And maybe some of those things are out of your control. They're not even things that you have brought about on your own. Life is just tough. You don't have to walk in that today. That doesn't have to define our life. There is hope. There is purpose. There is freedom. There is eternity because Jesus has overcome the grave. Then we look at Peter and his life. I find it interesting in another account of the Gospels of the resurrection, in Mark chapter 16, verses 4 through 7, the Bible says this, And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting at the right, wearing a white, a white robe, and they were amazed. And he said to them, do not be amazed. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who has been crucified. He has risen. He is not here. Behold, he, here is the place where they laid him. And now watch this. Go tell his disciples and Peter, he is going before you into Galilee, and there you will see him just as he said to you. I, I find that passage fascinating because the angel could have said, you go and tell the disciples and John. Or go tell his disciples and James. Or go tell his disciples and Matthew. Or go tell his disciples and any other of the disciples by name. But he names Peter specifically. Why? Well, if you know the Gospels, you know that it was just a few hours before that Peter was denying that he even knew Christ. That Peter was cursing and yelling at people and saying, don't talk to me, I don't know who this Jesus is. And Jesus, Jesus had told him that he would do this. No, Jesus, there's no way I would do this. I will, I will die for you. And remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, it was Peter who pulled out the sword and tried to, tried to get at the soldier and ended up chopping off the ear of the soldier. And just a few hours later, he's denying that he even knew Jesus. No, I don't know him. Jesus said, you'll deny me three times before the rooster crows, and three times, in fact, Peter denies Jesus. Now, friends, I'm going to tell you, we all know what it means to carry a sense of guilt around in our life. There are things that we have done, things that we have said, ways in which we have acted that we're ashamed of, that at some point in our life, we understand what that means to feel guilty over something. But have you ever felt guilty to the point where you are grief-stricken? Maybe you have. Maybe some of you are experiencing that right now. I guarantee you Peter did. Can you imagine the weight of guilt upon Peter's life? He had told Jesus, I'll fight for you, I'll die for you, I'll go to the cross so that you don't have to go to the cross. He tries to fight for Jesus in the garden and then finds himself in a moment of cowardice, denying that he even knows Jesus. Why? Because he was afraid for his own life. If, if they know that I'm with Jesus, maybe they're going to put me on trial too. Maybe I'm going to be on the, the tree next to him. And so he denies Jesus and then Jesus dies. And then Peter is just overwhelmed with guilt and grief. Oh, I can't believe that I denied knowing Jesus, and now he's dead, and now I'll never have a chance to say I'm sorry, and now I'll never have a chance to say thank you for all you've done. And, and he's just racked with guilt and sorrow and grief. And 
And at the tomb, the angel says, you go find the disciples and you make sure and tell Peter that Jesus is risen. That Jesus is alive. And can you imagine when Peter hears that? Now, we know the story also, and we go back to John, and we won't read it, but, but Peter goes then running, sprinting towards the tomb to see if the words that have been spoken are true, and he looks in and sees the body of Jesus gone. I mean, that boy, that boy ran fast to the tomb. Motivated by guilt, motivated by grief, motivated by sorrow and all the things that he could have done differently, all the ways he could have acted differently in light of the way that he did, he is going to live under the weight of that guilt the rest of his life, but now Jesus is alive. And then you know what happens next in John chapter 21, and we don't have time to read it all today, but Jesus goes to Peter. He specifically spends some time with Peter and has a conversation, and three times Peter had denied him, three times Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? Peter says, Lord, you know I do. And then Jesus gives him this great gift, this beautiful gift that God has ultimately given all of us through Jesus, grace. And he says to him, Peter, if you love me, Lord, you know I love you. I'm so sorry. I can't believe I did that. Peter, feed my sheep. You know what that means when Jesus tells him that? I mean, that's kind of a weird saying. Great, now I get to go take care of Jesus' pets. No, that's not what he means. He means you're going to be a leader in the kingdom that I've established as a risen Savior. Peter, I'm not not worried about what you said. I'm not worried about what you did. I died and overcame that. That's the whole reason that Jesus came on mission to the earth was for moments like Peter's life, moments like our life, where we cannot dig ourselves out of the guilt. We cannot dig ourselves out of the grief. We cannot dig ourselves out of the sorrow of our sinful choices and wrongful doings. This is why we needed a redeemer. And Jesus says to Peter, Peter, you're going to be a leader. God, I I messed up so bad. Peter, you're going to be a leader. Feed my sheep. And Peter does exactly that. Peter becomes one of the leaders in the early church. Once receiving the Holy Spirit along with the rest of the apostles, he becomes one of the great servant leaders of the early church. Christ restored him. Christ eradicated his guilt and his sorrow and his grief. And I'm here to tell you today, I don't know what kind of guilt you're living with. I don't know what kind of grief and sorrow you're living with bound up in that guilt, but this is what the resurrection does for you as well. There is no way in which you have to walk continually in a reminder of the things that you have said and done that have broken the heart of God and broken the heart of your fellow man. There is restoration. There is forgiveness. There is healing. There is all of that available to us. Why? Because that's why Jesus rose from the dead, so that we might have forgiveness in him that can only be available through him so that we can move forward in life without the burden of all of that guilt and sorrow, and despair, and discouragement. Jesus has overcome that for you and me. So today, whatever guilt you're living with, and it might be, hey, look, you might have done some really bad stuff. I mean, you might, you might be able to look at your life and go, there, there was no excuse for that. I mean, I can't come up with a good reason. Peter couldn't come up with really a good reason either. Except that in a moment of foolishness, he did what he did, just like the rest of us. And yet God, through Christ, forgave him. And so he will for you as well. Listen, forgiveness is available to you. I don't care who you are, what you've done, where you come from. This is what the cross and the resurrection is all about. So today, if you're feeling that guilt, you're feeling that sorrow, that grief, you can't go back and change the past. Peter couldn't either but you can walk forward in the grace and the mercy of a risen Savior who loves you if you will trust him, if you'll surrender to him. And then I want you to see one final thing of just absolute beauty. That's the disciples. Jesus lifts Peter out of his guilt and his grief over his sin. Peter lifted Mary out of her despair and discouragement, believing that everything that she had believed about Jesus was was now gone with his death. 
And then you come to the disciples, the rest of the disciples. In John chapter 20, look at verse 19. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. What an amazing passage. The disciples, after the death of Jesus, even after they have heard the reports of the fact that he is not in the tomb, that he is risen, they're they're still freaking out. And the Bible says that when Jesus meets them, they are hiding out. And we go, why are they hiding out? Well, they don't hide this. John gives us the answer. He says, because they're afraid of the Jewish people. They're afraid of the Pharisees. They're afraid of the religious leaders who had put Jesus to death. And their thinking was that if they put Jesus to death, just like Peter before had realized, maybe they're going to come after me too. And so these guys are hiding out. They're off the streets. They don't want anybody seeing their face. They don't want anybody recognizing them and going, hey, that, that, that Thomas, he was with Jesus. And so the Bible says that they're hiding out for fear of the Jewish leaders. Only three days earlier, they had watched the Romans at the behest of the Jewish leaders brutally crucify Jesus. And so their fear is that then they will be sought after next. And can you blame them? I don't know that it would be any different with you and me. I think that we can look upon the disciples and we can We can go, I can't believe those guys were hiding out. We'd probably be hiding out too. It's human nature. They had not yet received the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, the presence of the Holy Spirit. That that promise of the helper had not yet come, and so they are kind of on their own right now. And they're worried. And we go, well, why didn't they believe it, man? They've been with Jesus. Surely, why wouldn't they believe? Well, this isn't called a miracle for nothing. The idea that someone who was so brutally put to death could come back to life was a hard concept even for the disciples to believe. And yet Jesus appears to them. And he doesn't scold them. He doesn't say, I can't believe you guys are hiding out. What's wrong with you? I invested three and a half years of my life and this is what I get? Cowards. No, he says, peace be with you. And then they're like, whoa. By the way, it it doesn't tell us that Jesus knocks on the door or calls them ahead of time. He just shows up in their midst. Risen Savior, peace be with you. Then he says it to them again in verse 21. Look, Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. And then he gives them, once again, what he gave to Peter later. He gives them purpose. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. I'm not done with you guys. No, no, we're just getting started. And can you imagine how the fear must have melted away in that moment when they saw Jesus? I mean, I'm sure at first when he just appeared in the room, they were probably scared until he said, peace be with you. And that's what peace does. Peace calms our fears. Peace does away with our fears. And this is the peace that Jesus speaks over them, and this is the peace that Jesus speaks over you. And friends, it is a peace that only comes through a risen Savior. There's no other peace like this. There's nothing else in the world. There's no other form of security or accomplishment or hope that you and I can have but the peace that comes from a risen Savior who says you have nothing to fear because the greatest thing that you fear, death, has now been defeated, for I have overcome. And there are a lot of people in this room today, a lot of people around the world today who are gripped by fear. So much to the point that it is robbing you of the joy of living. Because what's going to happen today? What's going to happen tomorrow? What's going to happen next week? What happens when this happens and that happens? And I see all this stuff going around the world today and I've got nothing but doubt and fear. And Jesus is saying to you today as the risen Savior, peace unto you. For he has overcome all that you might fear. There's nothing to fear when Jesus has overcome it all. So today, what what are you dealing with? 
Is it an immense amount of doubt and fear about your future? About what tomorrow holds? Some of you are facing tremendous difficulties right now. You're facing disease. You're facing difficulties in relationships. You're facing financial issues. You're, you're just looking around the world wondering if World War III is going to start tomorrow. What's this eclipse about on the 8th? Are we all going to die? Like, what's happening? There's nothing to fear. Jesus says, as risen Savior, peace be unto you. Jesus says, I have overcome the sin of your life. So guilt and the grief over your guilt doesn't have to define you any longer. You can walk in the freedom of Christ. The despair and the discouragement that maybe you feel about life, Jesus says, I've overcome that too. See, because no matter what happens in this life, no matter what you and I face, here's the promise of the resurrection, that when you and I open our eyes in death, you heard me right, when we open our eyes in death, we open our eyes to a new life. We open our eyes to the eternity that God has promised and secured through the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our hope is not in our circumstances today. Our hope is not in where we will be four years from now or ten years from now. Our hope is in the fact that Jesus will welcome us when we open our eyes to him and he will say, well done, thy good and faithful servant, if we have trusted in him. And he will say, enter into the joy of your master because this is what Jesus has made possible. And maybe today that's, that's where you are. You need to give him that doubt. You need to give him that discouragement. You need to give him that guilt. You need to give him that sorrow. You need to give him that fear. And you need to lay that down, not at the cross, but at the empty tomb. Because all of that was washed away when that stone was rolled away. Today, you can know that hope. You can know that purpose. You can know that peace. You can know that presence of a risen Savior by trusting in him. The gospel is very simple. You and I are sinners. Every single one of us, no matter how much we try to downplay it, no matter how much we try to ignore it, the Bible says our hearts are wicked, but we do not have to try to save ourselves, earn our way into righteousness that has been given to us by grace and mercy through faith in the Lord Jesus. When you and I repent, meaning we turn from those things, and we trust in what Jesus has done on the cross and in his resurrection, salvation and hope is ours. And maybe today you need to do that. If you do, listen, Pastor Irby and I are going to be up here. We'd love to pray with you. We'd love to talk with you. You're watching online. Text the word alive to the number on the screen. We'd love to pray with you, talk with you about that. Whatever decision you need to make, whatever thing you need to pray about, maybe in this moment as we respond, you would do so. This, this is what Easter's about. Easter changes everything. Some of you have been walking way too long in the same path of fear and discouragement and doubt, and guilt, and the whole time, the empty tomb has changed the road that you can walk. So walk it. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your love for us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And not only did Christ die for the sins of humanity, he was raised up, overcoming sin and the grave, doing away with everything that constrains our hearts and our souls and our minds from your glory. And Lord, today we pray that, that your peace that comes through the resurrection would, would overcome our despair overcome our fear, overcome our guilt, overcome our grief, overcome everything that bounds us to this place of unrest. That we might rest in who you are and what you've done, Lord Jesus. You have accomplished what no one else could accomplish for us. You are the teacher. You are the Messiah. You are the risen Savior. And today we worship you and we yield our lives to you, Lord Jesus. And I pray if there's anyone in this room who has not done that, that today is the day they lay down that guilt, they lay down that despair, they lay down that doubt and fear, and they come to the empty tomb. And they hear your voice.
as you call their name. And they cry out, Savior, Teacher, Redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. Would you stand in an attitude of worship? We're going to respond through song right now before Pastor Irby comes and closes out our service, prays over our offering. Right now, you, you, you respond as the Lord leads you. Maybe, again, you need to pray with someone. We're up here. We'd love to pray with you. Maybe you want to come just kneel at these steps. Maybe right there where you are, you say, God, here's what I'm dealing with today. Maybe you're a believer already, but you've got some discouragement. You've got some doubt. You've got some despair. You've got some guilt. You've got some stuff that you need to give over to Jesus. Jesus, I've trusted you, so help me trust you with this. I need your peace in my life. And you cry out to the Lord as we sing. Let him deal with your heart this morning. be seated. Thank you for being a part of our worship today, this Easter Sunday. You're looking great. I appreciate that. Those of you watching online, so thankful that you can be a part of this. Just leave us a note that you are here. A couple announcements before you go. Sunday, April the 14th, ladies speak life at the farm. Meet here at the church at 430, and then they'll load up the buses and go out to the farm. So you want to be a part of that. At the information table, you'll notice there's deacon nominations. You can pick one of those up and begin nominating uh, deacons for the next term. And then on April the 28th, April the 28th, that's the end of this, uh, of the month, we're going to have our building dedication. We're going to have our normal schedule. I have life groups. 
We'll have Bible uh, studies. We'll have worship, both hours. And then after the second service, we'll have, uh, not on the ground, but we're going to have dinner in our new facility. Uh, we should be able to seat 400 people over there around tables easily. So you can be a part of that. The church will provide the meat and the drinks and wants you to be a part of that. So you bring a vegetable or, or some dessert that will feed 8 to 10 people. Now, the, the big announcement, if you are a guest, first-time guest, or it's been a long time since you've been here, when you exit these doors, turn to your left. Mm -hmm. Turn to your left, and before you get to the new building, you'll see a little room off to the side there on your left, and it says connect, and that's where the pastor's going to be. It's our pastor's reception room. We'd love for you to go down and meet our pastor and introduce yourself to him. So as you exit, turn to the left, and you'll see uh, the big sign, and you'll see uh, two double doors, glass doors. You'll go through, and our pastor's going to be in that room. be a great honor to him and our church if you would just go down there and say hello. Well, our tithe boxes are at the end here. If you'd like to drop your tithes and offerings there, let's pray and give back to God. Father, it is because of the old rugged cross that we celebrate this day. We don't celebrate because you died. We celebrate because you rose from the dead and you carried our sins with you if we'll believe, if we'll trust you, if we'll give our life to you. And Father, for those who have given our life to you, we give these tithes and these offerings out of love and gratitude because of that great, wonderful gift that you have provided. So Father, we pray that you'll take these funds, use them for your glory, spread the gospel around the world. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Don't forget, we'll be here next Sunday.